Hello and welcome to the very last online sanctuary service for 2020. I hope you enjoyed that Christmas carol which brought you into the service. Many of you know that Viola, my wife, is of Polish heritage, so we still have some Polish Christmas traditions which are being passed down to our children and their grandchildren and the grandchildren. I guess most of you are still living in Christmas land. The tree and decorations are still up. The fridge is full of leftovers and all around you, I hope, are some gifts that you've given or been given. Perhaps fewer than normal this year. I hope that all of you have had the gift of some real life contact with people you love over this time. Thankfully, we now have the gift of a vaccine, which we means we can all see light at the end of the COVID tunnel. Although it may be some time into the 2021 year before we're all rubbing shoulders in church, singing at the tops of our voices and giving hugs and handshakes to all and sundry. Even though the Magi probably didn't get to the newborn Christ until a while after his birth, we're going to hear that story today from scripture, from poetry, as well as joining in singing the story. So now let's begin our service proper with a few moments of quiet and then join me in the responses, which are a kind of a creed. As always, I'll say the words in yellow and you join in the words in white. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Thank, Thank you, Father. Father. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that although he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Thank, Thank you, you, Jesus. Jesus. The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Thank, Thank you, you spirit. spirit. We, we give, give thanks, thanks and, and praise you, Father, Father Son, and, and Holy Spirit. spirit for all your gifts and goodness to us.
wise men called Magi, probably from Persia, now in modern Iran, have been in search of the newborn child. They're nearly at the end of their journey. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests, and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. The Journey of the Magi A cold coming we had of it. Just the worst time of the year for a journey. And such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp. The very dead of winter. And the camels gored, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet. Then the camel men cursing and grumbling, and running away and wanting their liquor and women and the night fires going out, and the lack of shelters, and the cities hostile and the towns unfriendly, and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches, with the voices singing in our ears, saying that this was all folly. Then at dawn we came down to a temperate valley, wet, below the snow line, smelling of vegetation, with a running stream and a watermill beating the darkness, and three trees on the low sky. And an old white horse galloped away in the meadow. Then we came to a tavern with fine leaves over the lintel, six hands at an open door dicing for pieces of silver and feet kicking the empty wineskins. But there was no information. And so we continued, and arriving at evening, not a moment too soon, finding the place. It was, you might say, satisfactory. Oh, this was a long time ago, I remember, and I would do it again, but set down, this set down, this. Were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly, we had evidence and no doubt, 
I had seen birth and death, but had thought that they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here. In the old dispensation, with an alien people clutching their gods, I should be glad of another death. Do my part, yes, more. 
At the start of his letter to the Christians in Ephesus, Paul bursts out in a song of praise for all the year-round gifts that God has lavished on his children. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfilment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. This is God's good word to us. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Teresa. We've been thinking this morning about gifts, the gifts that we have received and given at Christmas, the gift of God the Father giving his one and only Son to the world, the gift of the Lord Jesus who stooped so low and became so poor that we might be raised high and made rich, the gift of the Holy Spirit who speaks to our hearts, enabling us to call God Father, and of course those gifts that the Magi brought, gold, frankincense and myrrh, at the end of their long journey. A friend of mine once told me that she was given a gift by someone who came quite a distance to give that gift. And when my friend commented on the trouble that she'd taken, the giver of that gift said to her, well, part of the gift was the journey itself. Perhaps part of the gift of the wise men was the journey that they made, their willingness to set out, not knowing where it would all end, how it would all end. Part of our gift this morning, back to God, is the journey that we are making towards him every day. And there's one small gift I want to give you today in this service, and that is the gift of a talk which is shorter than usual. That said, years ago, churchgoers would have felt shortchanged if they'd had a sermon that lasted less than an hour or maybe even two hours. How times change. In the Ephesians chapter that uh, Teresa read to us, Paul burst out with a song of praise and thankfulness for all the many gifts that God has lavished on his children. And that set me thinking, and it reminded me of uh, something I'd seen on the BBC website uh, a couple of weeks ago. Maybe you saw it too. It was about uh, a guy called Christian Piccolini, an American. As a teenager, he was disaffected, angry and lonely, hanging out on the streets, taking soft drugs. And that's where he was spotted by a leader of an American far-right white supremacy group, the Chicago Skinheads. This man befriended him and quickly recruited him into this hateful, hate-filled group. And Christian became actually one of its leaders and founded a rock band with the awful name of The Final Solution. Thankfully, in his early 20s, he's now in his 40s, in his early 20s, he abandoned this white supremacy group and since then has been working uh, to explain to those caught up in extremism and hateisms how wrong they are and to point to a different way forward. Whether he's a Christian or not, I don't know. But in the BBC piece, he said something which uh, really resonated with me. Speaking of the man who recruited him, he said, he saw that I was lonely 
and I was certainly doing something that put me on the fringes already smoking pot in an alleyway. He knew that I was searching for three very important things. A sense of identity, community and a purpose. Those are three very important things. A sense of identity, community, purpose. And I guess they're particularly relevant in our culture, uh, which is looking for significance and belonging. Now, I'll stick to my promise to be brief, but think how one could expand on those three words. But as I say, I'll resist the temptation. So briefly, a sense of identity. Anyone who is in Christ, who is following him, has been given a new identity. A new identity as an adopted child of God, as St Paul put it in that chapter from Ephesians. And also as St John put it in that wonderful opening chapter of his Gospel, where he said, To as many as received him, that is Jesus, to as many as received him, welcomed him and put their trust in him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. But as well as being children of God, we're citizens of a new country, not just Britain. It's different from the one that we inherited at birth. We are citizens of a heavenly kingdom. And part of identity, as well as being sons and daughters of the living God, we're also the friends of Christ and the brother of Christ. And then again, we're no longer like condemned prisoners in a cell, but people who've been pardoned and can walk free. And we have the privilege of diplomatic immunity because we are all appointed as ambassadors to the world, representing the head of state, King Jesus, and his kingdom, his kingdom of grace and love and peace and justice. So in those identities, no Christian, no matter how meagre their worldly uh, circumstances are or how difficult, they should be able to walk as if they were 10 feet tall with this God-given identity that comes from knowing, receiving Christ. And secondly, a sense of identity. Every Christian is part of a family, a family that we call the church, which is both worldwide and local. It's a place of belonging, of being accepted, known, cared for, valued. Sometimes in the New Testament, this community is described as a living, breathing body made up of many different but working together parts. Nowadays, we know that a, that a human body is made up of uh, billions of cells, rather like the worldwide church, which numbers billions. Sometimes this community is thought of as a beautiful building decorated with jewels. At its best, the church, especially the local church, is a place where all are welcome. I love that uh, contemporary hymn, Let us build a house where all are named, their songs and visions heard, and loved and treasured, taught and claimed, as words within the word built of tears and cries and laughter, prayers of faith and songs of grace. Let this house proclaim from roof to rafter, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Now, of course, I know that frequently the church as community fails to live up to that and to be a model for living together. Just as individually we fail up fail to live up to our identities and heritage in Christ, and that's why we bring our imperfections into the community of the church. But more often than not, the church is a good place to be. And here at All Saints in Western, uh, I'm sure that scores, hundreds would say that the church has been and is a precious gift of community to them. And lastly, this gift of a sense of purpose. You know, to have a sense of purpose, to know that your life counts and that you are more than an all too brief piece of flotsam in the universe, here today, gone tomorrow. To know that you have a purpose is a very great gift. 
is fundamental, I think, to be being human. Not to have a sense of deep purpose in life is to run the risk of running a shallow, empty life and one where the question, what's it all about, is a meaningless question or has no answer. In the Ephesians chapter, St Paul gave us one purpose, that we've been adopted in order that we might be for the praise and glory of God. And then in his next chapter in this letter, he writes, we're God's handiwork, created in Jesus in order to do good works, which God has prepared for us in advance to do. As you know, very often at the end of a service, the minister will say, go in peace. Why? To love and serve the Lord, to which we say, yes, in the name of Christ, amen. Our purpose, our deep purpose is to love and serve the Lord, to help goodness to flourish, to witness to the truth of the gospel, to be peacemakers and reconcilers, to be builders of worthwhile things, to plant that which is good. And as a Christian, the roles or the possibilities are endless because of that divine purpose which is related to our identity in Christ. So as you look around your room now, perhaps you may see various gifts, food, books, wine, toys, music, gift tokens, piling up perhaps on the sideboard and the table or even the floor. And as you do so, remember that the, those things will all fade one day and go to the recycling centre and there is nothing compared to the gifts that we've been given and continue to be given in Christ, among which are a sense of identity, a community to belong to, and a purpose which lasts until the day of our death and probably beyond. Amen.
I hope you enjoyed that, Carol, and that you sang the words on the screen and not the words that some of us used to sing when we were schoolboys. And that choir, well, they certainly held on to the O oh, Star of Wonder, didn't they? Our service is almost at an end and we're going to say our closing prayers, so do join in with me. When the Word became flesh, earth was joined to heaven in the womb of Mary. May the love and obedience of Mary be our example. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Christ child rule in our hearts and lives. Amen. Amen. And may we be filled with the joy of the Spirit and the gifts of your eternal home. Amen. And now let's say the grace together. May the, the grace, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and, and the, the love, love of God, God the Father and, and the, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be with us all and those we love and care for. Amen. So we're virtually at an end of this last sanctuary service of 2020. Thank you for joining in the service, whenever and wherever that is. It's been wonderful to think that so many people have joined in our virtual gatherings this year. Definitely another silver lining to the Covid clown. A big thank you to those who by one means or another have helped in the production of these services and have also sent encouraging messages about them. I expect our online services will continue on well into 2021 and then who knows what we'll be doing by way of live and online gatherings together. One thing is very likely, our church and most other churches won't just fall back into doing the exact same things that we were before all this came upon us like the whirlwind. We hope and pray for gentler breezes next year, but if there continue to be storm clouds, whether at a national or international level or at a personal level, we know that putting our trust and confidence in God will hold us firm. As someone once said, I may not know what the world is coming to, but I do know who has come into the world. Our Going Out song is a setting of a poem by Christina Rossetti, who also wrote the words of In the Bleak Midwinter. This poem of hers is called Love Came Down at Christmas, Love All Lovely, Love Divine. So may your Christmas continue to be a happy one and may it be a good, good New Year for you. Goodbye.